Okay. Um, we're going to get rolling here. I've got a, a, a subject matter that, that really came to home in preparing the lesson today. And I thought, wow, I've just never really approached it from this, from this angle. The beginning of the Parsha, uh, Leviticus, the sixth chapter, starts off and it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. That is the burnt offering which burns on the altar all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall burn with it. And the Kohanim, or the Kohen, shall don his linen tunic, and he shall don his linen trousers on his flesh, and he shall uh, lift out the ashes and in which the fire was consumed and burnt offering upon the altar and put them down next to the altar, and he shall take them off his garments and put on other garments. He shall take out the ashes to clean uh, a, a to a clean place outside of the camp to put the the offerings. And um, it just it just it all kind of came came to roost. So follow my thought here for a second. Uh, let's first start with some facts. It, each day the temple sacrifices were offered uh, on a stone altar. The altar had several stations, uh, wooden piles or, you know, like little bonfires set up, which a variety of sacrifices were offered. And as we can all imagine, we've been around bonfires. The, the result of this amount of debris to include the animal high, the fats and, and all that stuff building up, the, the priests were mandated to remove the ashes whenever there was a significant accumulation. And this was called the removal of ashes. In addition, each morning before the daily offering began, a Kohen was required to carry uh, a, a symbolic removal of the ashes, taking some of the ashes from the altar with a shovel and placing them in the heap on the side. This was also known as the separation of the ashes. In both cases, the Torah addresses the entire attire to be worn by uh, the priest, and it mandates uh, mandating the removal of the ashes and there is this mention of the clothing. Now, the, the Kohen should remove his clothes and wear different clothes. He shall then remove the ashes to, to a clean place outside of the camp. Rashi states, in order that he does not sully his regular clothes while removing the ashes, by the way of analogy, the clothes of the servant wears to the cook uh, to cook his master's meal should not be worn in pouring the master's drink. Rashi adds that the other garments were inferior to those normally worn. Now, it is understandable, according to Rob, uh, Rob um, my reference here, Yossi Ives, he says that, um, that, uh, that this needs to be a bit more explained. And there is a clear problem with the text it says that no one needs to be told that before you put on a new set of clothes, what, you know, before you put on a new set of clothes, it is necessary to remove the clothes that we're already wearing. So why does the text specifically instruct the Cohen to remove his clothes before continuing to the, the real point, which is that he should wear different clothes. Rashi, therefore, explains that the removing of the clothes is the real reason for the change. The goal is not the new outfit, but to prevent the original one from being soiled. Now, I want you to take for a second and let's move out of the mindset that this is about, uh, what do you call it, soil or um, uh, what do you call it, ashes and a garment. When we do tshuva, when we come before Hashem, we do tshuva. In some aspects, it is a sacrifice that we give. It's an offering to God. We give ourselves on the power of, of our uh, connection with God. The reason why an altar or offering is called a korban, it, we draw near to Hashem. And in drawing near to Hashem, uh, when the temple was standing, a person would bring a sacrifice, and that sacrifice would be elevated, put on the altar, 
and its ashes would be left there. And I just started thinking, I realized that the ashes in many aspects represents the leftover of your, of your, of your korban, your sacrifice. When we do tshuva, there are ashes that are left over from our tshuva. Just think about this for a moment. The ashes represents the, um, the past. It represents what was, but now no longer is, meaning your, your unintentional sin that you committed no longer exists. It's just an ash heap. But it's important to deal with the ashes. It was an importance to deal with the ashes. Everybody knew that someone was coming to bring an offering that had to do with uh, everything from an elevation offering to an offering of unintentional sin, whatever it may be. But no one knew the specifics. They only saw the ash. That's why it's important for us when we to look at this text, we realize it's teaching us a very clear and present idea that exists in our age today when we do tshuva. When we do tshuva, it's like bringing an offering. When we bring the offering, it's consumed on the altar. The ashes would represent our past. Now, with that being said, let me share a couple of ideas. Now, the, the burnt offering was a symbol of complete surrender and dedication to God. The animals was all without a blemish, symbolizing, symbolizing purity and uh, perfection, and was to be offered completely to God, symbolizing the complete surrender of oneself to God's will. The burnt offering was also a way of expressing gratitude for God, for blessings and for provisions in our life. As the Hebrews believed that the blood of the animal represented the very life of the animal, and by extension, the life that God has given them, and we do this out of a great demonstration that we feel ourselves should be the ones on the altar. Overall, the purpose of the burnt offering was to provide a means of expression and devotion, seeking forgiveness, closeness to Hashem, showing this true gratitude to God. And it was important part of worship and played a very central role in Jewish life period, whether it was in the wilderness or when the temple existed. And these practices continued on in the tabernacle, even when many Jewish people would be oblivious to what was going on because they were working and they were farming and they were taking care of their, their animals. The, the priests were doing a work for the nation. Now, the concept of repentance or tshuva is probably one of the most highly valued um, concepts that is spoken of in Jewish life, and it, the, the, the means of achieving forgiveness and reconciliation with God is only done through tshuva. However, the act of repentance is not complete unless a person also lets go of the past and, remove, and removes forward with this uh, renewed sense of uh, a purpose and, and commitment to do better. Now, one of the reasons why it is important for us to forget the past is that you that you have repented of is because dwelling on the past makes uh, mistakes and wrongdoings can prevent a person from fully embracing the present moment and working towards a better future. God is merciful and forgiving, and when a person sincerely repents their past, their sins is wiped clean, there is no need to dwell on the past. Now, if the ashes represent our past, our, our misgivings, etc., and it's removed. We also remember that the biggest element in a fire continuing to grow is to keep the ashes down. Too many ashes uh, can choke out a fire or choke out the ability to have a fire, which we learn a wonderful lesson that our chuva, our removal of the of the concerns of the past to look toward the future after doing tshuva is important because to dwell on those things, to constantly keep the past in your life will diminish your light. It will diminish your ability to, to really have a, a, a true fire burning within you. Now, one of the reasons uh, 
for letting go of the past is a person can focus on the energy and attention on the present and use their experience to grow and improve. This allows a greater personal growth and spiritual development, as well as a deeper connection with God. In addition, forgetting the past also allows a, a, a greater level of compassion and understanding toward others who may have also made mistakes in their past. It allows for more open and forgiving attitude toward those who have wronged us and enabled us to move forward with greater peace and acceptance. It's why when someone does us wrong and we hear the words from their lips, I forgive you, it's such a relief to hear it from another human being. Overall, forgetting the past that you have repented of is seen as an important step to achieving true repentance and forgiveness and in, in, in living a more meaningful and successful, fulfilled life. Forgetting the past completely is not always possible or even desirable. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. Uh, we would never want a child to forget that the stove they touched last week burnt them. We wouldn't want them to forget that. There are some things that you should remember and are good lessons for the past. Uh, it is important to learn how to let go of negative emotions and mem memories uh, that may be holding us back from moving forward into a healthy, positive way. Now, th there are a few things to remember. I want to take notes uh, for individuals who will be watching this who might be dealing with trying to deal with their past, their baggage, their stuff. It's like they realize that they have to clear it off after hearing this, this lesson. They have to get beyond their failings and move forward. So here are just three good tips that I'd like to share. First, practicing mindfulness, focusing on the present moment and observing your thoughts and feelings without judging ourselves. This is very difficult. Mindfulness can help you stay grounded in the present and reduce the power of negative memories from the past. Reflect on lessons learned and instead of dwelling on negative aspects of the past, focus on the, the lessons you've learned from those experiences. That mindfulness is, uh, is actually practicing correct thinking, thinking in a Torah sense and understanding what God has done and why it's important to move on. Next, create new memories that are full of life and mitzvahs. These are very important. Uh, also, for a person struggling, it's, it's important to talk to someone, talk to a professional, talk to a rabbi, talk to a fellow uh, believer that you are uh, have a relationship with and trust and can talk to them about it. Now, I'd like to focus just a little bit on the idea of self-sacrifice, uh, this idea that we have no temple today, and so therefore we cannot bring a physical sacrifice, but we ourselves are at, at some level practicing self-sacrifice and sort of a denial of your own uh, intuitions, your lust, your desires, and, and, and forming them into uh, a connection to God. Self-sacrifice is a concept that is often associated with, with, with religious and spiritual practices, but it's also an essential element and the pursuit of success in really any area of life. Self-sacrifice refers to the act of giving up something of value, such as time and money and personal comfort in order to achieve a greater goal or benefit uh, or to benefit others. Uh, my wife and I often will, you know, watch something and see that somebody has been extremely successful and become multimillionaires and live a very lavish, beautiful life. And we look at that. And the, the beautiful thing about being our age is you realize everything that glitters is not always gold. That's number one. But number two, what they had to personally sacrifice and what they continue to personally sacrifice to maintain that is much more than I'm willing to do. I've said this before with people who serve in these elite military units, as much as a soldier or an airman or Marine would love to wear the nice beret or the fancy outfit that distinguishes them from the rest of, 
of uh, military service, most do not want to put up with the sacrifice to do the job. And that's the whole point is this idea of self-sacrifice is huge. And obviously, if you put self-sacrifice in your relationship with God, then you're going to see a giant return as well, because God says that if you do not treat him casually, well, of course, he's not going to treat you with any level of of casualness. There are several reasons why self-sacrifice is important in the pursuit of success. Now, first, self-sacrifice, it helps us develop a greater sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. And by sacrificing first own personal comfort and desires in order to achieve a, a greater goal, these are really important. Uh, self-sacrifice is what you and I do on a weekly basis when we study the Torah. Uh, we're not talking about doing some uh, cultish religious practices. We're not flaying ourselves with whips, but really we, we are taking what our normal inclination and drive would be and shifting it toward connection to God. That is, in essence, the epitome of the, the pious person's text, uh, what do you call it, connection to God. Look, in Jewish wisdom, forgetting the past can have both a positive and negative connotation. On one hand, Judaism places a great importance upon upon um, uh, repentance and shuva and forgiveness. And in this context, forgetting past wrongdoings can be seen as a very positive step forward in rebuilding relationships. However, there is a warning to the Jewish people not to forget where they came from, not to forget Mitzrayim, not to forget the struggles they had, and to not forget that they have one God who has chosen them as his people. The Torah also emphasized the importance of remembering and learning from the past. The Torah instructs the people to remember the exodus from Egypt, as I said, and commands even high holy days to commemorate these great events that took place in, in the Torah. Overall, Jewish wisdom suggests that forgetting the past should not be done hastily or without consideration for the potential consequences. We're not talking about uh, a spiritual frontal lobotomy. We're talking about someone who clearly understands that there is a past, but they don't dwell in it. They don't roll in the ashes of their past. They allow their past to become a pathway of wisdom that connects them uh, to God and also brings wholeness in their life. Now, while it may be necessary in certain situations to move forward and let go of those past grievances, it is important uh, to remember the lessons of history and strive to grow and to become better. In conclusion, self-sacrifice is an essential element of pursuit of success in any area of life, whether it involves sacrifice and personal comfort and time, uh, your resources, your money. Uh, mitzvah, uh, doing mitzvahs is about personal sacrifice, is about doing things or doing for others instead of first to yourself. And in this lesson, we learn about the taking out of the ashes, the symbolic removal of those things that are from the past that have been given to Hashem. May we today, as we remember our tshuva throughout the day and tonight, that we remember that yesterday is gone and today is a new day. Hashem's mercy is renewed every day in our life. And Baruch Hashem, that we have that knowledge and that comfort to know that God himself does not desire for us to dwell in the past. That concludes my sure, and let's get into some discussion. How about that?